Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm back here. Sorry, I was closing the door. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming today. Welcome to Saturday Physics. Uh, my name is Kevin Pitts. Um, for those of you who've been here before, um, I'm one of the hosts of the Saturday program. And so usually on any given Saturday, I'm here to introduce the speaker. Today, I'm the speaker. Uh, you know, we ask all of other faculty members, and at some point we just run out, and then I have to give a talk. No. Actually, one of the things I would say, I've been doing this now for eight years, and there's never, ever been a case where I've gone to a faculty member and said, would you give a Saturday talk uh, to the Saturday Physics program? I've never had a case where they said no. And this is an all-volunteer army, and I really appreciate all the faculty members over the course of many years um, who've been willing to do these talks. Today's talk's a little bit different because I'm not going to talk about my area of research. I'm going to talk about some uh, physics related to something that I think some folks find is an interesting topic, which is UFOs. But before I do that, let me just give you a couple of other announcements. I get out of breath running up down the stairs. Chasing Shelby should be enough to get me in good shape. So um, for those of you who've been here before this fall, um, you know that what we've been doing is starting you off with a joke. Courtesy of my daughter Shelby, who's back there. Can you wave? Hi. So are you ready, Shelbs? Here's today's joke. What does a mouse eat for dinner? Now you can remember that this is a kindergarten joke, okay? So help me out. Cheesecake! <laughs> it kills in kindergarten, believe me. Good job, Shelves. That was a great joke. Did you hear him laugh? Yeah, she rolls her eyes. Uh, give me a break. Okay. Um, um, the Saturday program runs every other Saturday during the fall term, and so uh, in two weeks from today, Amy Guida from the law department is going to be here to tell us about law and science. And so this is a flyer for, for Amy's lecture. that will be two weeks from today, same time, right here. And um, um, you probably recognize Amy's name. She does legal issues in the news, uh, both in the News Gazette and also on WILL. So she's uh, always talking and, and thinking about how uh, issues with respect to the law may, may tie into uh, recent events and, and, and uh, current events. Uh, and uh, she's going to come and tell us about how some issues in legal profession uh, tie into uh, to science. So that should be very interesting, and uh, we're looking forward to that. So two weeks from today, I hope you can all come back. And by the way, it feels a little warm in here. Apparently, the university implemented some new policy about trying to conserve energy, and part of that policy is to dump all extra heat into this room. So I don't know, I don't know why that is. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you just before we get started is that there are actually several people who really do a lot to make this program happen. And uh, one of the real movers and shakers is standing up right in the back of the room. She actually pulls everything together. That's Tony Pitts. Let's give her a big round of applause. She, she does a huge amount of work to make all of this stuff happen, and we really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to do some pretty cool demos today. And uh, one thing I can tell you for sure is that none of these were my idea. But in fact, we have some really great minds who help kind of put some of these things together and pull them together. Erica Smith's right here, uh, Marion Evans, Bernie Dix in the back, and, uh, and uh, let's see, um, uh, Rachel, I'm going to forget, uh, Keenish, Keenish? Keenock, sorry, Rachel Keenock. She's back. She and Bernie are actually also running the videotape, which I'm actually going to have to erase after this lecture because uh, otherwise the UFO crackpots are going to want to track me down. So um, anyway, <laughs> we really appreciate all that they've done and all the stuff with the demos. It's actually really pretty cool. So let's thank them. Um, also, um, I saw Debbie, and I don't know if I've seen Steve already, but I wanted to acknowledge Steve already because Steve actually has, uh, I've talked with him a lot, and he's given me some really interesting material that I've incorporated in this lecture. And Steve's another professor. We both do experimental high energy physics for our day job. We don't hunt UFOs or anything. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Steve's discussions to help me out um, with some of this stuff. So, um, OK, without any further ado, let's get started. Now, what I want to start with, uh, many of you got uh, one of these clickers, which I don't even think I left myself with an extra one. Can I borrow your clicker? One of these clickers. Now, first of all, let me just say thanks very much. The physics education group here in the physics department was nice enough to loan these to us. These are demonstration clickers, and so it's really important that we recover them all uh, at the end of the lecture, OK? Uh, for those of you who might be interested in taking them and using them in another class, since these were actually beta testers, they don't work elsewhere. So it doesn't do you any good to take them with you. So please, please, please. Uh, I think it's going to be fun to vote on some of these questions. Um, which is why we're doing this, but we really do need to get these back at the end of the lecture, okay? So I really appreciate your help with that. Um, the way these things work, I'm going to start in just a second. I will ask you a question, and what you do with your clicker is you press the on button, and you'll see a little light come on, and then you can press A, B, C, or D 
to, to uh, enter your answer. We have a little base station right here that collects your answers. At the same time, it collects all of your credit card information. And so um, we actually will use that to make some more purchases. But, uh, <clears throat> and then I'll show you the results, OK? Uh, you can vote more than once, but, the, but the, the base station only records your last answer. So if you vote A and then you change it to B, then it'll just store B. And if you click B five times, you don't stuff the ballot box with lots of Bs, OK? So um, without further ado, let's start out with a vote, OK? So here's the question. In your opinion, are UFOs something real or just people's imaginations? That's the question. If you think it's real, I'll, I'll start the uh, vote. Don't vote yet. I'll start in just a second. If you think that the answer is A, real, uh, vote A. Uh, B is just people's imagination. And C is I don't know. And so I just started the clock. Now you're welcome to turn on your clicker and vote, OK? And the base station will start counting. There we go. The votes are coming in. The votes are coming in. Al Franken, 51.1. Norm Coleman, 49.9 something. OK. There's 100 votes so far, which I think we gave out about 100 clickers. So that's probably everybody. Those of you who didn't get a clicker, I'm sorry we ran out. but. Um, so this is some random sampling. Certainly the high school students in the crowd all got a clicker, which is really good. So um, we got about 100 votes here, so I'm going to stop. And now let's see what people said. Out of those 100 votes, 44 said A. OK, I, can, I actually know what happened here. I know what happened. So 44% said A, UFOs are real. 38% of the folks said B, it's just people's imagination. 15% said C, I don't know. And these three students are here from Physics 140. <laughs> so I want to write these numbers down real quick because I want to come back to this in just a second. Uh, a is 44, B is 38, C is 15, and uh, D and E are none of the above. OK. So let's do this. I want to do another vote. New question. Do you think that UFOs have ever visited the Earth in some form or not? OK, A is yes, B is no, C don't know. I will start the clock, and you can now vote. Wow, this is a very quick responding cloud. That's pretty impressive. OK, so it looks like three people have already dozed off. Two people. One person woke up. OK. One person's still snoring. All right. That happens sometimes. OK. So let's see what this says. 42% said uh, UFOs have visited the Earth in some form. 43% have said they don't. C is 10% said I don't know. OK. So um, interesting. Very interesting. Kind of a, you know, pretty much a 50-50 split, I would say. Now let me just show you something. These same questions were asked in a Gallup poll about 12 years ago of a random sampling of Americans. You are not quite a random sampling of Americans, but we can still stack up to see how you did. Uh, the first question, in your opinion, are UFOs something real or just people's imaginations? 48.5% said real, 31% said imaginations. And let me just put up the numbers here. Um, let's see, for us it was here 44. Pardon my penmanship, but I'm left-handed. And this was 38. 38, and then just then I can doodle. OK, and then the don't know, I think, was 15. So actually, that's not so different. And, um, and then here it was 42, yes. 43, no. Probably with the statistical uncertainty on this sampling, I would say we're completely consistent with the sampling of the country as a whole. Now, that sampling's 12 years old. Maybe, maybe uh, the country would think a little differently now. But it's kind of interesting. It's very split, right? I mean, these are kind of, you know, 44, 38. That's, you know, almost half and half. 42, 43. That's a pretty good split. And of course, there are folks here who don't know, which is certainly fine. So um, it's kind of interesting. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think, let's look at this first question. In your opinion, are UFOs something real or just people's imaginations? Is this a very good question? How many of you thought, well, let's see, UFO means unidentified flying object. Are there things up there that are unidentified? Yes. Therefore, UFOs are real. Did anybody kind of use that reasoning? Sure. It makes perfect sense. Did some of you immediately think UFO means alien spacecraft? And um, since I was abducted last Friday night, yes. 
right? So, so I think this question is incredibly vague because it can be interpreted in very different ways. UFO is a kind of a prejudicial term. That UFO might mean what it really means as the acronym, unidentified flying object. Nothing in there about aliens, you know, from Vulcan or anything. Um, or, you know, some people, many people interpret it to be spaceships coming down, okay? So I think it's actually a bad question. It's interesting, it's kind of 50-50, but I think it really doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't say that necessarily 44% of you think that aliens have landed on the Earth, okay? So um, I want to come back and ask you a slightly different question, which I think is a little more straightforward, and that is, do you believe that life exists outside of the Earth? So let's, let's, uh, let's vote on this one. And on your mark, go. Oh, we had some new voters, new enters, enter entries. Okay, let's stop there. So I'm actually going to write this one down on the board. It was 81% yes. Sixteen percent no, and five percent don't know. So, so pretty overwhelming that folks think that life exists outside of Earth. Well, I'm going to come back to that question a little bit later, but that's why I wanted to write the write the, the numbers down here. And I'm just approximating the percentages because it's 81 out of 102. That's pretty close to 81 percent. All right. One more vote, and then we're going to put the clickers down for a few minutes, but we'll vote again a little bit later. Okay. One more. Do you think that beings from another world have ever visited Earth? So I'm trying to get directly at the spaceship question, okay? So one more vote. Let's try this one now. So it looks like about 28... 27%, 28% yes, somebody's changing their answer. Uh, 28, 64, 10. 28, 64, 10. 28%, 64%, 10%. Those are physics 140 students, again, trying to beat the system. They do the same thing on the exam. All right. I have to, that's why I have to stop. Locked out. Okay. So in this case, 28% uh, said yes, so about a quarter of you. 64% um, or about two-thirds of you said no, and the rest of you said I don't know, which is, uh, so anyway, those, so those are kind of interesting numbers. So notice, though, that uh, this number, uh, have we been visited, 6428, that's certainly very different than 4243 that we had for the UFO question, and that was my point about the fact that that, uh, that UFO question is pretty vague. It's actually a pretty bad question, I think, because people interpret it different ways. Okay, so anyway, that's a little bit of fun uh, kind of uh, clicker stuff, and uh, we're going to vote on a few things a little bit later as well. So hang on to your clickers, but you're not going to use them for a little while. So let me tell you a little bit about what I want to talk about today, and um, we'll see how far we get on this. Um, I, I, uh, first of all, I want to tell you that I'm not an expert on UFOs in any way, shape, or form, and it's not like I have a hobby chasing UFOs or anything like that. What I really want to tell you about today are some... Uh, Physics issues that are related to, or would be related to, uh, long duration, long distance space travel. And what would aliens have to overcome to come and visit us, or what would we have to overcome to go visit them? So I'm going to try to tie in a little bit of science with a little bit of folklore. Um, but like I said, I'm not an, an expert in this. I don't do research in this. It's kind of a, uh, I guess you might say, a little bit of a hobby. Um, and so um, if you already have a strong opinion one way or another about UFOs, there's probably nothing I'm going to say today that changed that opinion. But like I said, I'm going to try to put things in a little bit of a context so maybe you have a, a little better judge when you see some funky show on the History Channel about abductions or whatever. You can maybe be a little better judge of, of kind of what's, what's valid and what makes sense and what doesn't. Um, I do want this to be fun and interactive. Um, I actually, it was funny, I was putting this together and I kept thinking things I wanted to add and add and add. And so it turns out this lecture is going to be about three and a half hours long. So I thought what we might do is uh, we might go for about two hours and then break for lunch and then come back and pick it up again. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, so anyway, these are the things I want, to go, I want to go over. I bet I don't get to all of them. Okay, we'll get as far as we can. Um, I won't get everything. But I do have a few interludes in here uh, where I just kind of want to kind of inject a few things that may be relevant to this, not just a UFO discussion, but discussions of these types in general. Okay? Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from Einstein. 
the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it's comprehensible. And so uh, keep that one in mind as we uh, go forward. I like that quote. So um, let's get started by um, getting uh, expert testimony. The first thing you'd like to do is say, okay, what do the experts think? So let's go and immediately get testimony from what are really, really, truly, I have to, let me, let me get out here. Really, really, truly experts. Let's see what the experts have to say. All right, do you guys believe in UFOs? Think yes. it's possible. Yes. 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 So you're saying that and you don't. No, I do. You no. do? Okay. Why do you ask a question, get an answer, <laughs> and then dispute the answer? answer. Wow. Because you're smiling. Okay, I do. UFO means unidentified flying, flying objects. objects. Right. There's yes. some things in the air that are unidentified, but, but do we think that they come yeah, from mean, another I mean, planet? I mean, aliens in space. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Why? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's close-minded to evidence. think that we're alone. Okay. Yeah, but do you think universe. people are flying around or aliens are flying around trying to check us out? Well, we're well. flying around trying to check other things out. I mean, so. according to Don Teague, hmm. some people in the heart of Texas believe it is possible. Take a look at this. Hmm. So after I saw this, I sent email to Matt Lauer and I, I advised him to not go off the teleprompter anymore. So that's a true. That's one of our true experts uh, weighing in. You know, if 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 it's if the Today Show says they're coming, then they must be coming, right? Now let me just flip over. I'm not going to spend any time on this, but there's a website from PBS Nova called Origins, which features people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a well-known astronomer, um, and talks about some of the same issues that I'm going to talk about. And um, I, I, I would highly recommend this, uh, this website. You just, if you go to PBS Nova uh, you, and you look up Origins, I'm not going to spend any time on it. But uh, I was kidding about the Today Show being the experts. Guys like Tyson are the real experts, and so I just wanted to point that out. Um, the other thing actually is very interesting, uh, I forgot to bring the book with me, but if any of you have ever read or, or know about this book called The Physics of Star Trek, it's actually very interesting. A guy by the name of Larry Krauss wrote the book, and what he does is talks about warp drive and uh, uh, inertial dampers and antimatter, but he puts them in a context, he's a, he's a serious astrophysicist, and he puts them in a real con context of, of real science. And it's actually very interesting because he tells you what things might be feasible and what might not and what would need to Need to, uh, need to happen. So if you happen to be interested in this stuff, actually, that's a very good book. I would recommend that. The other thing I just wanted to say in terms, I said this is a hobby. I actually teach a class here at the university called uh, Science and Pseudoscience. It's a, a freshman discovery course. Um, and this is my crew this semester. These guys are great. We're having a lot of fun in this class. And we talk about what's good science and what's bad science and what's pseudoscience. Pseudoscience is stuff that sounds very scientific, but in fact is really kind of garbage. How many of you have had somebody tell you that the best way to cure your back pain is to strap some uh, magnets onto your back? Have you ever heard something like that? That's called pseudoscience. Okay? They give you a lot of sa scientific sounding reasons for it to work, but it turns out that it's all garbage. That's pseudoscience. We talk about that. And these are just some of the, the topics we cover. And in fact, they all do class projects. And a couple of groups did UFOs and alien abductions. And so I'm actually drawing on some of their material for this lecture today. So we're having a lot of fun in that class. And, uh, and uh, I really enjoy that, we're talking about some of these issues. Okay, so let's start talking about some of the technical issues that are associated with, with space travel. Okay? The first thing you need to understand is the speed of light. Speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, okay, which is about uh, um, three, let's see, uh, thousand million, 300 million meters per second. Now, the easiest way, to, I think, to conceptualize this is 186,000 miles is roughly seven times around the wor world. Okay, seven times around the world is, is roughly 186,000 miles. So if we go 1,001, one second, a beam of light could have tra traveled around the world uh, seven times. Okay, so that's a long way, all right, in one second. Speed of light is very fast, all right. Uh, so light gets from the sun to the earth in about eight minutes. So if our sun actually underwent a cataclysmic explosion right this instant, we would have eight minutes to have some more coffee before we would act, the information would actually get to us, okay. So hopefully that doesn't happen because my lecture is more than eight minutes. We have to get through the whole thing. All right. Um, light getting from Earth to Mars or Mars to Earth, if you imagine that, that we, uh, we were to land a spaceship on Mars and wanted to communicate. Well, it depends on if Earth is close to Mars because, of course, they're in, they're in different orbits. If Earth is close to Mars in their orbit, uh, then it's about three minutes. But if they're on the uh, kind of opposing side of the orbits, it can be as much as 22 minutes because, in fact, it's even further than the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So it depends on the orbits. But this is just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of uh, the speed of light. Light is incredibly fast, travels incredibly fast. It's the fastest thing that we know of. Um, but it, uh, when you start talking about universal distance scales, it still takes a long time for it to get there. All right? <clears throat> Albert Einstein, in 1905, published the special theory of relativity. And you're probably, familiar, at least in terms of words, and I bet you're familiar with this equation, 
which is uh, very important to things like nuclear power plants and atomic bombs. And also the research that I do in elementary particle physics, we actually exercise this equation every day. Actually, it's very funny. I saw an article in the newspaper yesterday that said, after 103 years, the equation e equals mc squared has finally been proven to be correct. I was, like, I was thinking to myself, you know, my gosh, uh, we've proved that it's been proven to be, you know, supported or correct uh, in the laboratory where I learn, work at Fermilab basically every day for the last 30 years. I mean, why did they get a newspaper article? It's been proven for 100 years. So uh, anyway, this is a very famous equation. But that's not the consequence of special relativity I want you to remember today. The consequence of special relativity that's also been verified experimentally that I want you to remember today is this one. No information or object can travel faster than the speed of light. The speed of light is nature's speed limit. Einstein started from the theory of relativity, uh, from some postulates, um, and made the theory of relativity, and this was a consequence that has been experimentally tested. Okay, so first of all, I want to uh, show you a couple of examples of the speed of light. And so the, let's see, the first one is uh, Snell's law here. Wake up. OK, so up here on the screen, actually got what this is is uh, this is just a fluid here, and this is air, and I'm going to put a laser beam into this. And so what happens here is the laser beam's coming in this way, and it bounces off the surface, and it comes back down. Okay, watch what happens when I change the angle a little bit. OK, watch what happens when I change the angle a lot. Now notice what happens. The light beam is now coming. It's hitting this surface. Some of it's being reflected back, and some of it's actually going through. But notice it's not going through at the same on the same line. Now what's happening there is, in fact, the speed of light is different in different materials. And so in fact, the speed of light in air up here is actually faster than the speed of light in this fluid. Okay. Now. When I say 186,000 miles per second for the speed of light, that's actually the speed of light in vacuum, which would be like in outer space. And that's the fastest it goes. So speed of light in vacuum is the way I should really say it is the speed limit. So the speed of light in air up here is just a little bit below the speed of light in vacuum. But these are, and it's going even slower here, uh, a little bit slower than it is in, in, uh, in vacuum. So this is just to give you a sense that the light speed can change depending on how it's going. When we talk about speed of light in vacuum, like outer space, like the sunlight getting from the sun to is kind of the, the right number. That's the speed that I'm talking about. Okay. Now I have another demonstration here that I want to use to, to kind of show you about the speed of light. Um, like I said before, uh, Erica and Bernie and Marion, they're the ones who come up with this kind of very clever, this clever idea. Now up on the screen now, I've got uh, an oscilloscope. And what we have set up here is basically kind of like, it's not quite FM, but it's like a transmitter receiver, like radio. Okay, so I'm going to turn on your and so what's going on here is we're actually generating a signal, and this is our broadcast antenna, 96.5 on your FM dial. And so the signal is coming out here from the transmitting antenna, and that's actually on here the yellow wave, okay? It's just a sine wave. And then this is our receiver antenna over here, and you can see when I get in the way, I kind of screw it up a little bit. Uh, this is the receiver, and uh, that's the blue, okay? And it's, it's jostling around a little bit because I'm moving and bouncing off of me and things. What's going to happen here is um, I'm going to put this line right at, the right at the crest of the receiver wave, right there. So it's right at the crest of the blue wave. All right. And so what's going on here is that these radio waves are traveling through the air from the transmitter to the receiver, just like it happens when you receive radio waves in your car or on your television set if you have an antenna or a satellite dish. And so it's traveling through the air. In fact, if I get in the way, notice I can screw it up a little bit. I'm going to get out. And so that's, that's where we're receiving it. Now, the horizontal axis here is actually time. And it takes time for the signal to get there because speed of light is not infinite. It's finite. So watch what happens when I move the transmitter a little bit closer. Watch what happens to the crest of this peak. Don't, you know, the whole wave is going to move. But watch this as I move it closer. It moved to the left. Now. I moved this about three feet closer, OK? Now, when I talk about the speed of light being 106,000 uh, miles per second, another way to think about that is that light travels about this far, about one foot in a nanosecond, OK? A nanosecond is a very, very short period of time. Light travels about this far in a nanosecond, OK? There are more nanoseconds in one second than So a nanosecond is an incredibly short period of time. It's one billionth of a second. And that's how far light travels. So 
I moved this about three feet closer. And in fact, that peak moved uh, on the scale. I, 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 I'm not going to show it to you, but in fact, it moved to the left on that thing by a distance of, or distance, I should say, by a time of three nanoseconds. So in other words, this signal is now being received three nanoseconds sooner than it was before because of the speed of light. In other words, these radio waves that are traveling through here are traveling at the speed of light, which is about 180,000 miles per second. And if I slide this back again, it's now taking longer, taking longer, taking a few nanoseconds longer to receive that signal. Now, nanoseconds aren't something we can notice without some pretty fancy electronics, but you can actually see that the light's not infinite. That there's, it takes time, but it's very fast. Okay? Uh, another good example of that is if you're ever in a thunderstorm and you see the lightning, and then a little later you hear the thunder. Well, the lightning still takes some time to get to you, but it's a very short period of time. The speed of sound is much slower, so it takes longer for the sound waves to get to you. So, uh, so you can count the difference between uh, the, the lightning and the thunder, and it's about five seconds per mile. That's from the speed of sound. But anyway, so the speed of light is very fast. That's important. But even more important is that it's nature's speed limit. Okay? And so why is that? How do we know that? Or how can we test that? Well, this is a picture of the accelerator up at Fermilab. Fermilab is located in the western Chicago suburbs. And uh, if you've ever flown into O'Hare or Midway on a western approach and you look out the window, the person sitting next to you always says, it looks like a giant crop circle. And so I did a landing strip. Not really. Uh, this is a particle accelerator. And so what we do with this particle accelerator is we accelerate protons. Protons are, remember, pro protons, neutrons, electrons? We take the protons, we accelerate them to very, very, very high energy. Okay? So they go to high energy. And in fact, there are a bunch of accelerators. This is the big one. That's the biggest accelerator. This is a pre-accelerator. And in fact, there's a smaller one here, okay? which, is, which is actually kind of lower energy. And so the protons that circulate the speed of light, 6,000 miles per second. We start accelerating these protons, and in the low energy ring, in this lower energy ring, their speed is already at 99% of the speed of light, which means instead of 186,000, it's 184,500 miles per second. So we're already close to the speed of light, okay? And there's still low energy. And then what we do is we keep pumping energy into them, keep pumping energy into them. Just like if you want to go fast in your car, you pump energy into it by stepping on the accelerator. What you're doing then is you're, you're putting more fuel into the engine. That, that's adding energy to the car to make it go faster. We're doing the same thing with protons. We're pumping energy in, pumping energy in. And by the time they get into the big ring, their speed is now 999999C, which is 185.9998 miles per second. You keep pumping energy into them, they never break the speed limit. This is an incredibly, incredibly strong proof of the consequence of special relativity that the speed of light is nature's speed limit, that you cannot travel faster than the speed of light. These particles are incredibly high energy. These are energies that haven't been naturally since a few microseconds after the Big Bang. Okay? Incredibly high energy particle, and they don't break the speed of light. So, by the way, I, I didn't say this. I should have earlier. You may recognize it. C is the speed of light. That's the variable I, that we use for it. So this is within an eyelash of the speed of light. But if I kept pumping even more and more, I would never get to 1.00 C. I'd never get to 186,000 miles per second. And that's been proven experimentally in a number of different ways. This is one way that I think is very impressive. So nature has a speed limit, and that's very important because now, once we figure out how far apart things are, how long it's going to take to get there. Okay? Are there questions? Did you have a question? Does anybody have any questions for me so far? It actually is kind of comical when you ask me stuff that I can't answer, so feel free to fire away. Yes? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. So the Large Hadron Collider, which is the new collider that has just come online in Geneva, Switzerland. In fact, we have a group here uh, who's involved in the experiments there. Um, it actually takes the proton beam to up even higher energy, and uh, so it gets even a hair closer to 186,000 miles per second, but it won't. It, and in fact, it's already been shown that it won't go above. So yes, they'll get even closer because it's a higher energy. It's putting more energy into, that, into the, into the uh, in machine. Other questions? Some folks are saying, well, can't we vote on some more stuff? <laughs> all right. OK, so now we know the speed limit. All right, that's important. Uh, we need to know how far things are, how far apart things are. And so let me tell you about a unit here. One light year. Now, it sounds like a light year, and there's a year. Wait, year's time. But in fact, light year is a measure of distance. Right? And so it's the distance that a beam of light would travel in one year. And if you put in the numbers, it turns out to be about 6 trillion miles. That's a number that's pretty doggone big. Uh, I can't comprehend it in my brain, but maybe you know, uh, you guys have a sense of how big a trillion is because it's a big number. 
Um, it's even more than my paycheck, believe it or not. Light travels 6 trillion miles in one year. All right? So let's try to put this in a little bit of context. Here's the Milky Way, side view. We are in the Milky Way. It's good to be home, isn't it? We're in the Milky Way. This is what it looks like. There's a center of Milky Way. There's a very strong experimental evidence that there's a black hole right in the middle of our, uh, our uh, galaxy. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that because we're about 25,000 light years away from that. The Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. If you turn on a light beam right here and ask how the other side of the Milky Way, 100,000 years. The Milky Way is about 100,000 light years in diameter. Okay? Now, we're kind of out a little bit on the edge. This is us. You are here. You know how they always have the maps, right? That way you get your bearings straight. You are here. We're about 25,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. So it's huge. Okay? It's enormous. And even traveling at the speed of light, it would take a heck of a long time to get to the other side of the Milky Way. OK, so who's in our neighborhood? All right, here's the neighborhood right here. Who's in our neighborhood? Alpha Centauri is the closest star. It's 4.3 light years away. If you could travel at the speed of light, you would get there in 4.3 years, four years, four months, roughly. OK? If you ask how many stars are within 100 light years of us, and actually 100 light years is a number that I'm going to come back to a little later, so I'm using this on purpose, it's roughly about 14,000 stars. Well, that sounds like a lot of stars, 14,000. I'll tell you a little bit later, in fact, that there um, are about 200 billion stars in the Milky Way. So 14,000 out of 200 billion is kind of a small number. But about 14,000 within 100, 100 light years. I said we're about 25,000 uh, light years from the center of the Milky Way. OK, so if we want to travel to other stars and other planets, or if they want to travel to come and meet us, OK, travel here, then uh, what do they need, or what do we need? It's the same question for both species. We need to be able to travel near the speed of light. We're not going to be able to get over the speed of light. We need to travel close to it just to make things feasible. And we also need to be able to handle long duration space flights. Okay? If you can travel close to the speed of light, it still takes you four years to get to the closest star. And if you want to go anyplace else, it's going to take even longer. So we have to handle long duration space flight. One thing I should say, um, there are effects from Einstein's special relativity that change this argument just a little bit. I'm not going to go into that today, though, because it really doesn't change any of the conclusions. So I didn't want to get uh, put in relativistic details, because it doesn't change your conclusions. But if folks have questions after the talk, I can tell you a little bit more about how special relativity would change things. Okay? But it really doesn't change your conclusion. So those are two things that we're going to need. If we're going to go somewhere, or if they're going to come visit us, you've got to be able to travel at very high speeds, but you're not going to get above the speed of light. And um, you need to be able to handle, handle long duration space flights. OK, questions? Anybody has a question? OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just break. I'm going to break for just a second and uh, give you a little bit of an interlude here. It won't be long, and we'll get back to UFOs. Uh, things aren't always as they seem. Anybody remember this picture? The face on Mars? A few years ago, or I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there were a bunch of books written. And this was supposed to be proof that there was life on Mars. Even if it's not there now, this was like one of the pyramids they left behind. The face on Mars proved that aliens once inhabited Mars. This was a big deal a few years back. Well, one way to check that would be to look a little more closely. Okay? So we looked a little more closely, and it kind of looked like the guy from Planet of the Apes. right? Um, this, was, this picture was taken in 1995 uh, from the Viking Project. Uh, uh, and, and so, yeah, it kind of looks like there's a face there. But you know, we've sent a lot of probes to Mars, unmanned probes to Mars, who can image the surface more closely. And so let's take a look with a little bit higher resolution. There's that face that you were that was supposed to prove that aliens once inhabited Mars. That's what it looks like. This is a close-up uh, from the Mars Express that was taken in 2006. And actually, some other pictures, you can go to the NASA website and look at some other angles and things. And it's basically, it's just a lump of rocks. I mean, it's a, it's a mountain or something. OK, so that's my first interlude. Things aren't always as they seem. OK, so I personally, maybe I'm a little skeptical. I don't think this was put together by an alien civilization. Or if it was, it somehow doesn't look like that. Anyway, things aren't always as they seem, OK? All right, so here's where we are in the outline. I like to put the outline up as we go along so that the people who are itching to get the heck out of here know how much longer they have to wait. OK. I said you need to figure out how to travel very quickly if you want to get to other stars, other planets, OK? Or if they want to visit us, they need to figure out how to travel quickly. And so that's the next thing I want to talk about. OK. So how fast have we been able to go so far? Well, the fast the object that has contained people was the Apollo 10 spacecraft. 
it reached a speed of about 25,000 miles an hour. And if I put that in context with the speed of light, it's uh, about uh, 0 0.000037, what is that, 10 thousandths the speed of light, okay? So it's nothing compared to the speed of light, even though it's pretty doggone fast uh, for mankind, okay? That's the fastest thing that we've ever had a person in. Um, the fastest man-made object, there's a Helios 2 space probe, which is out actually uh, in orbit around the sun, uh, and it actually has achieved a speed of 158,000 miles per hour, which is triple uh, oh two four point oh 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 two four the speed of light. So it's still nothing compared to the speed of light, basically. But it's still you know 100, 185, uh, 158,000 miles per hour is pretty fast. Now, important thing to note here is that this speed is actually achieved because of its orbit. It's not achieved by the rockets. In other words, it was lifted off Earth into space and to put it into an orbit. Actually, the speed it achieves comes from the actual orbit itself. It wasn't because there was a bunch of fuel on board that made it go that fast. Okay, but that's just to give you a sense of scale of where we're at in terms of our technology, how fast we can go. So we got a little work to do if we want to get up close to the speed of light, right? Actually, we got a lot of work to do because we have to get rid of a bunch of zeros here in front of our, uh, our seat, all right? Work to do. That's not to say we can't do it, but I'm saying we're very, very far from that, okay? Now, how do we get up to outer space? How do we move around? How do we accelerate? Well, uh, of course, we use rockets. Here's a picture of the space shuttle. Uh, here's a picture of a, of a Saturn V rocket that lifted up Apollo. And one of the things to remember is that, uh, for those of you, especially the folks old enough to remember the Apollo program, that, you know, the actual space capsule's right up here on the tip. So what's the whole rest of this rocket? It's all fuel. It's all fuel. You take your fuel with you, and, of course, you burn it as you go, and that rocket is about, you know, 90-plus percent fuel. All right? And so when you get up to, the, you know, the lunar surface, you've got this kind of this craft that can barely fit two guys in it. And then, uh, you know, when they come back, there's this little capsule that can barely fit three people in it. And likewise with the space shuttle. Now, the space shuttle is actually much, much smaller than a, a large airplane. You know, it's smaller than a 727, for example. Um, and this big thing, the uh, liquid rocket boost booster, is all fuel. These guys, the solid rocket uh, boosters, those are all fuel. So, when you, so it takes a huge amount of energy, obviously, to lift these things up. And it takes an enormous amount of fuel. But th wait a second, it's kind of a problem here. Uh, you want to take more fuel so you can go faster? But the more fuel you take, your rocket's heavier, so it's harder to go faster. So yes, as you take more fuel, you go faster, but it becomes untenable very quickly. I mean, it's, harder to make, it's hard to make bigger and bigger rockets because now you, know, you, need a, you, know, you need some tank that's the size of Lake Michigan to hold all your fuel, but now you're trying to lift all of Lake, Lake Michigan off the surface of the Earth. So that's a, that's a real challenge. Now, the good news about this rocket travel is that um, you know, it works even in outer space. Okay? Standard airplane engines won't work in outer space. Rocket travel will. But like I said, you've got to carry your fuel with you. So I had a couple of examples of how uh, rockets actually work. And I, um, I actually need, well, I'm going to do one myself because I'm a daredevil, but then I'm going to need a couple of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, volunteers for the other one. So we have a rocket car here. This is our uh, version of the Saturn V, okay? It's an air extinguisher on a cart. And so it's going to work under the same, exact same principle as the Saturn V rocket. Some of you have seen this before. You're already putting your fingers in your ear. So um, I'm going to just do this not much, but I do suggest you cover up your ears, and I'm going to get on. And uh, if somebody over there could actually catch me if I'm out of control. Okay. So I'm going to pull the pin. There's some kind of countdown associated with spaceflight, right? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Cover up your ears. I always like it when there's that little extra delay after zero. You think something's gone wrong, and then you <laughs> So I was traveling. Was it? You think I made it close to the speed of light? <laughs> it was pretty scary, though. Believe me, it was harrowing, and it was pretty noisy. So what happened there? Of course, there was a bunch of compressed gas stored in that cylinder, and so I pull the pull the. Uh, why are my ears ringing? I, I I pull the handle, and that gas can escape now. And so, basically, the way to think of this is that the cylinder is pushing that compressed gas out that way. And by Newton's third law, remember Newton's third law, equal and opposite forces? You ever hear that one? The gas is pushing back on my cart, and that causes my cart to accelerate the other way. Okay? That's how it works. The same thing happens here. Now, in this case, you actually burn fuel, uh, uh, enriched oxygen fuel, burned. And when that happens, it causes you to exhaust a lot of gas out, and it causes you to, to accelerate. What you're doing is you're ejecting mass. So you're carrying all this fuel with you, and as you throw it out, it goes faster. And I need a couple of volunteers to show a similar concept. One right here, and I need somebody else. Can you do it? Are you guys are you good on skateboards? Can you really boogie on the skateboard? And can you do tricks and flips and things? 
No? That's okay. I don't need you to. Come on up. Here, let's I'll put you right over here so folks can see you. Okay, what are your names? Daniel and Elisa. Daniel and Elisa? Okay, so each of you get on a skateboard. I'll help you out a little bit so you don't fall over. All right. Now, so here's what we've got. Now, imagine, put, can you put your hands up kind of close to each other here, just so you're kind of up against each other? So, Daniel and Elisa are now my spacecraft, okay? Now, Elisa is the capsule, and Daniel is the fuel. So, Elisa, I want you to give Daniel a little bit of a shove here. Now, notice that they both went apart. Now, they didn't go apart very far. Let's come back together and try that one again. It takes a little practice. I don't want you to fall over or anything. Okay, give him a good shove. Now, Elisa pushed Daniel, and Daniel went that way. But what did Elisa do? She went the other way. So, Elisa applied the force on Daniel. What she was doing, remember I said they're both my rocket? Daniel was the fuel? Elisa ejected some fuel at a low rate, but she ejected the fuel. What did ejecting that fuel do? It made Elisa accelerate in this direction, and so she rolled away also. Okay? And so let's try it one more time. Okay. Now, Daniel, did you push back when Elisa pushed you? Just hold your hands. You're just a wall here. Okay? You're not even shoving. You're just minding your own business. You're just fuel. Okay? Can you be fuel for me? All right. Daniel's fuel. Give him a good shove. And they go apart. Daniel didn't actually push back on Elisa. He's just there holding his hands, minding his own business because he's fuel. But by Newton's third law, as soon as Elisha pushed on Daniel, Daniel had to push back. I mean, the force was applied. And so Daniel, the fuel, goes out this way, and Elisa, the rocket, takes off that way. And that's how rockets actually work. It's by Newton's third law. But of course, you need lots and lots of Daniel. Like I was saying, lots of fuel. You need lots and lots of Daniel if you want to go very fast and go very far. And it helps if you can actually shove him all away really fast. And, of course, this fuel comes flying out of this rocket at very, very high speeds. Okay, thanks very much, both of you, Elise and Daniel. So that's how rockets work. That's how rockets work. And so now, if we want a rocket, imagine that we use some new technology. That's one of the things you can always say in a UFO talk like this. Well, obviously we need new technology, but we, maybe we can develop it. And that's certainly true. Now, um, imagine for a minute that we develop a new rocket or we develop some new technology, fusion technology, ion drive, whatever you want, that allows us to get up to high speeds, okay? Now, we have to get up to speed. You start out at rest, you know, the, the rocket that's on the surface of the Earth, it starts out at rest and then it kind of takes off, takes off, takes off. So, um, we need to accelerate, all right? So, we need to get going faster and faster. And let me show you what I'm talking about with acceleration. I like to do this because I get to see the people in the back row eye to eye. So what's going to happen here is that there's a small cup of water at the bottom of this bin, and I'm going to dive into it head first. Not really. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take two cups of water. Here's the first cup of water. I'm going to drop this cup of water. Watch and see if the water comes out. Bombs away. Water didn't come out. The water fell down, the cup fell down. What if I do this instead? I'll stand up this time. Not that I'm afraid of heights or anything. I'm going to poke a hole in the bottom of the cup. Okay, poke a better hole than that. There we go. Okay, still have some water in here. Let go of the cup this time. Well, let's take a look. Did the water go out the hole? No, the water didn't go out the hole. It actually, they still fall at exactly the same rate. Now, the important point for this discussion is that as the cup fell, it was accelerating. What do we mean by acceleration? Acceleration means you're speeding up or slowing down. As soon as I let go of the cup, right when I let go of it, how fast was it going? I was just at rest. I was holding it at rest. Then I let go of it, and it starts heading down. One second later, it was traveling at about 32 feet per second. That's how fast it was traveling. Two seconds later, it was traveling at 64 feet per second. All right, and the numbers I have up there are 10 and 20 meters per second. But the point is, as it falls, it goes faster and faster. That's acceleration. When you're sitting in car, at the stoplight, and you push on the accelerator, 
you're adding, you're, you're, you're adding energy to the car, and of course you're starting at rest and you are speeding up, you're accelerating. All right? You ever, sit, you ever, you ever uh, stand on the accelerator, accelerate really fast? I know you never did this, but um, I've heard about people who accelerate really fast and you feel like you get pushed back in your chair. You feel like you're pushed back in your chair. Uh, another example is if you're uh, going around a corner, and you're going around the corner very quickly, and you feel like you're going to slide out of your seat. Or if, you get, if you're at the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the carnival and you ride the, uh, I, th I always thought it was called the rotor, but my students told me it's called the graviton, where you're up against the wall and it spins around, and then the floor drops out. So that's another example of, a, of an acceleration. And so you feel forces. You feel apparent forces when you accelerate. So when you really step on the gas in your car, not that any of you have done that, you feel like you're pushed back in your car. Well, there's a limit to how, fa how fast we can actually accelerate before it's actually bad for our body. Let me show you an example of this. So what was happening there? Uh, they're in some kind of uh, fighter, fighter, you know, like an F, F, uh, F-16 or something like that. Uh, and if you get up to like, uh, uh, so when that cup falls, when that cup falls, it's accelerating at 1G. That's, that's acceleration due to gravity. It's 1G. Uh, we can actually handle 2 or 3Gs, and we'll be okay, although it's not very comfortable, because it basically makes you feel like you're 3 times, 3Gs makes you feel like you're 3 times heavier than you are, okay? And so for me, you know, I'm like 200 pounds of all muscle, but for me to feel like I'm 600 pounds is still not very comfortable. Um, after the lecture, I'll flex for you. But um, anyway, um, what happened there in, the, in that fighter, pilot, fighter, fighter plane is that it, they probably got up to 6 or 7 Gs. And now what happens is, you know, that, that feeling I was telling you about of being pushed back in your seat? Well, now, in fact, you, you, you know, that feeling back in your seat can cause the blood to be pushed back in your body and not get into your brain and cause you to, cause you to pass out. That's what actually happened there. So, you know, you get up to 10 Gs or, or 11 or 12 Gs, and really bad things can happen to you, okay? So humans can kind of comfortably withstand, or I say comfortably, can withstand 2 or 3 Gs. So think about this. In fact, they say this for the space shuttle. Uh, guidance for the space shuttle, when they, uh, it says don't go past 3 Gs, and in fact they only handle 3 Gs for about 7 minutes or 8 minutes, and then they turn it down for physiological constraints. It actually is hard on the spaceship, too, to accelerate at very high rates. Okay? So um, imagine we can have a spaceship that can go uh, close to the speed of light. We've got to get up to that speed kind of gradually, or else all of our astronauts won't be with us when we get up to that speed. So that's something else to consider. Okay? So let's imagine we have the technology to build a spaceship that gets us to three quarters the speed of light, just to pick a number, okay? That's about 20,000 times faster than the Apollo ship could actually, fl actually flew. But let's imagine for we actually get up there. Now, if we start at rest near the Earth where we build our spaceship, uh, we only want to accelerate at three Gs so that all of our astronauts are not killed, okay? So how long will it take us to start at rest and get up to three quarters of the speed of light with an acceleration that's only three Gs, okay? Which is still a pretty big acceleration compared to what we're used to here on Earth. How long will that take? About 116 days. Okay? You have to have enough fuel on your ship to accelerate continuously, 24 hours a day, six days a week, for four months to get up to three quarters the speed of light. Okay, well, hey, it's a long trip anyway. What's an extra four months between friends, right? Well, don't forget that, in fact, when you go to slow down, it's exactly the same thing. So when you get to your destination, you need to start putting on the brakes a little early, and it's going to take you another four months to slow down. So again, it's not but imagine how much fuel it would take to accelerate continuously. Imagine you just you know, step on the accelerator in your car, and you wanted enough gas in the car to make sure that you could continually accelerate for four straight months 24-7. I think that's more than like 15 gallons. I'm not sure, but I think it's more than about 15 gallons. So anyway, these are just technical limitations that you know, are going to be associated with long-duration spaceflight or high-speed spaceflight. Um, that we have to keep in mind, okay? Any questions about that? 
Okay, all right, let's keep going. Another interlude. Anecdotes do not make science. How many have heard this? This is a completely different subject, but this argument. Um, argument like, this is just an example. I'm taking an example of cigarettes. How many of you have heard somebody give you this? Your friend had a cousin who knew this guy who had an uncle who smoked 10 packs of cigarettes a day and lived to be 108 years old. Therefore, cigarette smoking is not a health hazard. Has anybody ever heard this argument? Right? I don't believe all those studies uh, because, you know, my friend's buddy's uncle's sister-in-law's cousin smoked 18 packs a day and lived to be 12 or whatever. You know, it's an anecdote. Even if this story is true, this is called an anecdote, all right? It's not real data. It's an anecdote. Even if this anecdote is true, this could be true. This could be true. It does not discount all of the, and it might be true, but it does not invalidate the huge number of serious scientific studies on health effects of cigarette smoking. You cannot take one anecdotal story or even a handful of anecdotal stories that are not controlled. You don't know, you know anything else about this person. You don't, know how, you, know, you, know, you don't know enough information, and it doesn't fit into a larger kind of scientific statistical study picture to allow you to draw any conclusion from this story at all, even if the story is true. Anecdotes don't science. So when it tells you that they saw a UFO and you deem them to be a credible witness, that still doesn't mean that necessarily they saw a UFO. It doesn't mean they didn't. I'm not saying that they, they didn't. I just state that accordingly. Anecdotal stories do not make science, and we throw them around a lot. Uh, the greatest place where you see anecdotal stories have to do with health. I did this, and my cold went away. Everybody did that same thing, taking, standing on your head and taking echinacea for six hours. And I felt fine in seven days. So you do the same thing. Okay, that's an anecdote. Um, this, came on the, this came across the wire yesterday. It's a little wordy, but I wanted to read this because I got a kick out of it. Um, annual sales of the herbal remedy ginkgo dollars. It's alleged to prevent memory loss, and in, true, and in fact, it doesn't. In its first large trial, there were 1,000 volunteers who were 75 and older. Half of them were given ginkgo daily, were given a, and there were assessed. Neither patients nor the doctors doing the assessment knew which group the patients were in. That's a double study. This is science, okay? And uh, the, uh, the group getting placebo actually did slightly better, although the difference was not significant. In other words, dope doesn't help memory loss. This study shows that. Yeah, do we need to do more studies to verify that? Cross-check it? Absolutely. This is a serious science of the anecdotes. And notice what, uh, this is from Bob Park. Here's his website. Very interesting. Uh, one after another, the most powerful supplements, ephedra, echinacea, St. John's wort, have all failed in double-blind placebo-controlled studies. Anecdotes do not make science. A couple of other topics. I'm starting to run a little late on time here, and I know, I know some of you go, folks are too long. I want to talk about one other limitation to space travel, and then I want to just say a few words about, uh, about uh, whether or not they're out there, okay? And, uh, and we'll wrap this up. So what do we need? What have we learned so far? We, need that we, we know that we need a radically new technology to accelerate and decelerate our space, okay? We know that we have flights, decades to get to the nearest star, all right? So I'm not talking about, when I say long duration, I'm not talking about two-year or three-year or four-year round trip to Mars. I'm talking about decades to get to some nearby star, okay? What other dangers exist for long-duration space flight? Radiation. That's the one I want to tell you about, the other danger, okay? And um, while, while I'm doing that, let me just tell you that you can actually see some radiation. We have a cloud chamber set up over here. It's actually a supersaturated gas. Cosmic rays are coming down from outer space all the time. Our magnetic field from the Earth and also our atmosphere actually do a very good job protecting us, so we don't get a huge dose of radiation from cosmic rays. Um, and what I'm going to tell you, once you get outside of our atmosphere and outside of our magnetic field, you do get a huge dose of radiation. But some cosmic rays do make it down here to the surface of the Earth. And when they go through this saturated gas, they actually leave little vapor trails. Just like the vapor trails you see if you look up on a clear day and you can see the trails from jets. You're not actually seeing the jet itself making its trail. That's actually here. You can see little tracks. There's one right there. There's one over there. And so those, there's one. That's a cute one. Um, when you're a scientist, you assign you know, cuteness to different events. It's kind of weird, but all right. Um, anyway, so you're actually looking at radiation, okay? A little bit, not so much. This is what uh, a, uh, a study found for National Research Council. It's a very, very kind of important. At present time, knowledge, the level of radiation astronauts would encounter would not allow a human crew to undergo Mars mission and might seriously limit long-term moon activity. But radiation in outer space problem, okay? And once you get away from the nice little nest that we have here on Earth, it's very, very bad for your health. Okay? And so forget about talking being in outer space for 10 years, 20 years to go to a star, imagine if we had the technology. Even going to Mars in a tush is very, very dangerous to your health. And in fact, they're saying they're not sure if it can happen or not. Okay? Uh, astronauts in the space shuttle or the International Space Station, they actually still get some benefits of the Earth's magnetic field, but they actually see a much higher radiation dose than we do here on the Earth. 
Okay? And here's just a picture of high energy cosmic rays hitting our upper atmosphere, which helps protect us. This is a picture of the uh, magnetic field, which also helps protect us. So we're very cozy here on the surface of Earth. But once you leave the uh, nest, uh, it becomes a problem. Okay? Radiation would be sufficient to kill humans in long space flight unless you found ex a, a sufficient shielding. Okay, how can we stop radiation? Well, how about putting a 10 foot thick, 10 lead wall in front of yourself? That's a great way to stop radiation. But that's a heck of a lot more mass that you have to accelerate with all that fuel you were going to take with you. Uh, the other thing you may be able to do is generate a gigantic magnetic field in your spaceship to help keep these particles away from you, just like the Earth does. Again, uh, very challenging technology. Not out of the question, but radiation is a very, very big concern for long-duration space flight. Even they're talking about a manned mission to Mars. Radiation is a very, very, very major issue that's very hard to solve. Okay? So who can handle large radiation doses? Humans, we don't do so well. Who handles large radiation doses? Cockroaches can handle enormous radiation doses. So let's think about the consequence of that. If other civilizations, being from other civilizations, are coming to visit us, the humanoid kinds are going to have problems with the radiation. Who's going to make it here to see us? The bugs. The bugs can handle the, the radiation. They're going to be the ones who come to visit. Okay? So uh, we're going to have a hard time going to see that. Bugs will come and see us. Yeah, it's amazing, actually. It's amazing that cockroaches can handle ridiculous amounts of radiation, um, and they're fine. And uh, I, do, I don't pretend to understand the physiology associated with that. But uh, anyway, it's kind of interesting. All right. So uh, one more interlude, and then I want to try to wrap this up. Um, this, is a, this is an example of UFO sighting. It comes from a while back, but I want to just go through this. Uh, um, spot a black triangular craft hovering for several minutes. Um, a uh, reported the object would jump ahead or change altitude rapidly, and they managed to get a radar lock. It could fly 9,000 feet to 5,000 feet in seconds. There was no sonic boom when it broke the sound barrier. Okay, so what's my point in telling you this? I don't have an explanation for this. I can't immediately say, oh, obviously that was a reflection off of the low-level atmosphere because of the temperature variation or something. I don't have an explanation for that. But that doesn't mean that it's unexplainable. Okay? And there's a difference, because a lot of times folks who are trying to kind of peddle pseudoscience, do you have an explanation for this? Well, then therefore it's unexplained. You know, and you say, no, I don't, and therefore it's unexplainable. That just means we don't have enough information to really figure out what happened here. And so the point is that, yeah, this is interesting. This should be studied. I'm not trying to discount that. But what I'm saying is you can't take sightings like this. I already said they're anecdotal evidence. But you cannot take them and say, because I can't explain it, that I'm supposed to then jump to the conclusion that that means there are real UFOs out there. All right? If there are real UFOs out there, and by that I mean you know, spacecraft, we need more information than this to determine that. Okay? So that was an interlude. So where am I? Is there anybody out there? I just want to say a few more words, because I apologize I'm getting long, but I, I, uh, I, I really uh, wanted to just say a few more things. I want to give you a sense now. I tried to give you a sense of the, 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 the distance scales. I want to give you a sense of the numbers. Now, Forget about space travel for a minute. I just want to talk now about this question about are they out there, OK? Now, I mentioned this earlier. There are uh, two, about 200 million stars in the Milky Way, all right? 200 million stars. And if you're familiar with scientific notation, that's 2 times 10 to the 11th. That means it's 2 with 11 zeros after it. That's in our galaxy, OK? That's just our galaxy. And there are many other galaxies out there. Andromeda is a galaxy. M100 is a galaxy. There's a bunch of them out there. And in fact, if you look out with the Hubble Space Telescope, what you see is that there are a boatload of galaxies out there. In fact, a lot of the things that you see at night that we call stars, okay, a lot of those things are actually in galaxies. So there are about 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Now let's think about that for a second. 200 billion stars in our galaxy and about 100 billion galaxies. So how many stars are there out there total? Well, if you put together the number, it's this one. It's that many stars in the universe, roughly. OK, maybe I'm off by a factor of two or three. It doesn't change your conclusion. It's a number with a heck of a lot of zeros after it. OK, it's 10 to the 22 stars in the universe. OK, there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the Earth. <laughs> you know, think about going to the beach. <laughs> There's a lot of grains of sand on the beach. More stars in the universe than the grains of sand on, uh, in, in the entire Earth, OK? It, it makes you feel like maybe we're not so special all of a sudden, right? The chances that a few of those stars have planets going and they might develop life, kind of like ours did. Well, when you've got this many chances, I would say the chances are pretty good. And in fact, most of you said the chances are pretty good, too. Uh, do you think that life exists outside of Earth 
81% of you said yes. It's quite possible that life exists on other planets or moons in, within our own solar system, but if it doesn't, we still have a heck of a lot of other chances for life to exist. Okay? So there's a huge difference in these two questions that we started with today. One question is, is there life out there? And I have some more information, but I want to, in the name of time, I, want to cut, I don't want to keep going here. I would say the chances that there's life out there are pretty doggone good. In fact, there may be lots of civilizations out there. That's one question. Second question is, have they visited us? That's a very different question. And there are a lot of limitations to long-duration space travel and whether or not they could get here or whether we could get there. Now, as I said before, you can say, well, technology. We can just develop technology. Maybe we can do that. And I agree. I agree with that. There's just one more point I want to make, and then we'll call it a day, all right? And the last point I want to make is, oh, I, ha I did have one more interlude, but let me skip that one. No, let me don't skip it, because I got a quick kick out of it. I'm sorry. Um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Carl Sagan. The reason I want to show you this is this is an email I got once somebody on the web saw that I was giving a UFO talk. Actually, I got quite a few emails from some very interesting people about UFOs. It was kind of funny. Anyway, um, this person is saying, um, uh, I've read there seems to be a fair amount of evidence saying that there are uh, witness reports and physical trace finding radar kinds. And so then he goes on to say, the extraterrestrial hypothesis seems plausible for explaining at least some of the UFO sightings. Well, it might seem plausible, but is that enough to tell us that they're really here? No, I mean, plausible solutions are the solutions that we're already aware of. You know, the ones you're going to pick first are things like weather balloons and atmospheric effects and Venus and things like that. I'm not going to jump to the amazing, amazing conclusion that we are being visited by aliens from another world based on a plausibility argument. I want more evidence than that. And Carl Sagan said it best. If you're going to make an extraordinary claim, you better back it up with extraordinary evidence. And a folk, few folks seeing something, even if it's on a radar or seeing it you know, from their car or whatever, is not extraordinary evidence. That, don't mean, that doesn't mean you discount the evidence. It means it's not enough on its own to make the sale. And there's this thing called Hume's Maxim, which really says the same thing. And the reason I like this is because if you really want to get somewhere in life, you need to have a maxim. It's nice. So I'm still trying to come up with my own maxim. I don't have one yet. But I think it's cool if you have a maxim. Anyway, um, last thing. Sorry about this. Speed of light is the fastest thing, right? And, so, and, and light waves are traveling all over the universe. This is how we see other, other stars, other galaxies, and things like that. So how would we very likely make, and this is the electromagnetic spectrum. What I'm saying is, you're talking about uh, uh, FM waves, AM waves. Uh, our demo here was with kind of just above FM. Uh, uh, microwaves. Here's the visible light spectrum, infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays. These things, all these waves travel at the speed of light, OK? And in fact, we actually monitor the whole spectrum. In fact, we're jamming it full of things like cell phone uh, uh, transmissions and things like that. But we monitor this whole spectrum. And these things all travel at the speed of light. If we make contact with uh, beings from another world, it's going to be by electromagnetic transmission. We're going to see their wave first before we see the people or the aliens or whatever. That's what we're going to see. And as a matter of fact, we're looking. We are looking. As a species, the human beings are looking. It's called the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Project. These are a bunch of radio telescopes. They are combing the heavens for signals. From, there are lots of signals out there, but the signals they're actually looking for are the ones that might indicate some deterministic pattern. Okay, deterministic patterns that might come from other civilizations. They haven't seen any yet. This is the right way to look for aliens. Okay, this is the right way to look for aliens. And in fact, you can participate in this project. There's a thing called SETI at home. Same time, I won't go to the link. You can actually use your computer at home to help them analyze the data. It's really a cool project. Um, but this is going on. And in fact, if you saw the movie Contact, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we had the woman here on campus who was kind of the, uh, the, uh, the, the idea behind the Jodie Foster character. And uh, I will leave to you as homework to remember what Mr. Garrison on South Park said about the movie Contact. I'm not going to mention that now, uh, but you can check that out. So last thing I wanted to say, electromagnetic rays are going to know whether or not to come see us. So we have all these stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And imagine that there are beings in the Milky Way who, have, who can do uh, space travel, OK? And they could come and see us. How do they know, out of the 200 billion stars to go visit, how would they know to come here to see us? How would they know? Well, they might know if they could pick up our radio waves, OK? They might know if they could pick up our radio waves. How long have we been broadcasting radio waves as a species? 80 years or 100 years, roughly. 80 years or 100 years, something like that. When did we start transmitting television and radio and things? That's when our footprint started emanating out from the Earth. Okay, even though they're pretty weak signals, they're heading out. They're all traveling out at the speed of light. So how far away are those signals from now? 
about 80 light years. They're about 80 light years away. Let's call it 100 to round it off. About 100 light years away. If you're outside of the range of 100 light years from Earth, you have no way of knowing that there is intelligent life on this planet. I'm not even cracking a joke about whether there's any intelligent life on this planet. The point is, if you're more than 100 light years away from Earth, you have no way to have seen any signals from us to indicate that we're here. So if you're in another part of the Milky Way, you're over here somewhere, okay? Our footprint, our 100 light year footprint is smaller than this dot. So if you're an intelligent you know, species that can travel very fast, how do you know to come here to see us? You have no way of knowing. You're not going to know that we're here for another 20,000 years when our signals finally get to them, okay? So I actually think this is the biggest Biggest question, because other things you can argue with technology. Some way, someday we can figure out how to go faster. Some way we can figure out how to stop radiation. You know, those are technology things. This is a fundamental limitation. How do they know to come and see us? That, I think, is the biggest question. How would they know that we're here? Unless they're one of the 14,000 stars that are within 100 light years, they have a way of knowing to even come see us. Okay? So, anyway, I had some more stuff on uh, whether or not we visit. Obviously, the most known, well-known event is when Cartman got the anal probe, um, which is one of my favorite episodes of all time. But um, I don't want to uh, 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 belabor any more uh, time on this stuff because I'm already running late. Um, there's Roswell. I was going to tell you about that. But I'm, I'm, uh, let's do one more clicker question, and we're going to call it a day. I appreciate your patience. I'm sorry I went long, but uh, I really appreciate your patience on this. So do you believe that life exists at birth? We asked this question before. Can you, can you vote again? So it's about the same, about 80%. Let's do one more. Do you think that beings from another world have visited Earth? Last vote. About the same. Still got about a little less say yes now. Like I said, I didn't expect I would change your mind. If you, if you really, you know, if you're into it, if you're a true believer, Probably nothing I'm going to say is going to change your mind. Okay, look, let me wrap up. I know you folks are leaving. I'm sorry I went long. Uh, thanks very much for your patience. If you have any questions, feel free to come down and talk to me. Um, please, 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 if you can drop off your clickers on the way out, there's actually a bin right there by the door. You can put them right there. Or outside, you can put them on the table. Please, please, please drop off the clickers. Thanks for attention, everybody.